Gilgamesh, the Hero, retold by Geraldine McCochran, illustrated by David Parkins. This book is to be used for read-along and classroom use only. Introduction The Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest recorded story in the world. It was originally carved on twelve stone tablets which, over thousands of years, were smashed into thousands of shards. Even now, for all the painstaking work of restoration, different scholars place the events of the story in different orders, and some episodes are still lost. Gilgamesh is thought to have been a real king, reigning sometime between 3200 BC and 2700 BC, over the Sumerian city of Uruk in Mesopotamia, now Iraq. He led expeditions into neighboring territories to fetch timber for his grand building projects. The story of the flood. Several floods devastated the region, found its way into other cultures, ultimately into the Bible, undergoing changes according to the religion of the teller. The work of archaeology is incomplete. Some of the tile fragments still baffle interpreters. This version is a free adaptation from a variety of translations. Page 4 Chapter 1 Heaven Sent Gilgamesh dreamed that a meteor crashed to earth at his feet. Everyone came running from their houses, pointing, excitable. They crowded round the meteor, marveling at the hugeness of it, the harm it might have done if it had fallen on a building, on a child. They pushed at it, but twelve men together could not so much as budge it. In his dream, Gilgamesh put a strip of leather round the rock, and resting the strap across his forehead, strained to lift it. The crowd fell back in awe. Though it weighed more than a hundred sacks of grain, Gilgamesh lifted the meteor clear off the ground, and hands braced on his knees, staggered with it to his mother. But just as he arrived at her door, he woke. So he carried her the dream instead. It weighed almost as heavy on his thoughts as the meteor had on his forehead, and he had great difficulty explaining the passion he had felt towards this... this rock. It sounded so foolish. His mother, Ninsun, did not laugh. She did not make light of his dark dream. The gods are sending you a wife, perhaps, or a visitor, some foreign king or sage, someone of great importance. This is not the first time, he admitted. I dreamt another dream. Tell me, said Ninsun. I dreamed I was walking through the streets of Yurik, and I saw an axe lying on the ground. It was beautiful, mother. I had to pick it up. I had to own it. So I slipped it through my belt and wore it by my side, and I was so pleased to have it, I can't begin to say. He stopped short. It sounded so footling. But his mother did not laugh. Ah, now I see. It's someone much more important than a king or a sage or a wife. The gods are sending you a friend. Gilgamesh frowned. He did not know what to make of his mother's words, what to think about the prospect of a friend. He had seen rocks before, and axes, but even in a dream, he had never had such a thing as a friend. The idea was as strange to him as a piece of heaven breaking free and falling to earth. Hunter threw down his bundle of tools in disgust. He squatted down and cupped a drink from the water hole with both hands, then slapped the water so hard that a dozen little fish skittered out of sight. Three days and he had not caught a single animal. Someone had slashed his nets, smashed his snares, filled in the pits he had dug. But who and why? The fish regrouped. Hunter pulled a big waterside leaf over him to keep off the sun. Otherwise he would never have seen the creature come down to drink. The sight made all the hair stand up on his neck. The creature came down to the water, walking on the balls of his long feet, on the knuckles of his large hands. His entire body, but for the palms of his hands, the inside crooks of his arms, and the hollow of his eyes were matted with hair. But this was no bear or cat. He bent his head down to sip directly from the water, but this was no antelope or hog. He had a mane of long, wiry hair, but this was no lion. This was a man. Hunter waited, motionless, for the beast to finish drinking and to stalk away. He held so still that the fish nibbled his toes. He held still while ants crawled up his arms and the flies settled on him in clouds. 
Not until the creature had loped away, head up, the water glistening on his pelt, did Hunter snatch up his tools and run. Afterwards, he wondered if he had imagined it, the sun too hot on his head, the light too bright on the water. Next day, he had more to worry him than imaginary beasts. Once again, his traps were all smashed, his pits all filled up. Once again, he found himself cooling his anger at the waterhole. He splashed his face. He skimmed an angry stone. The stone bounced six, seven times, and a fist closed over it, and the man-beast was looking back at him across the lake, with sharp, dark eyes, teeth bared. Hunter fled for his life. It was there again, father. I saw it, he gasped as he stumbled into camp. Bigger than a lion, stronger than a bull. I've never seen a man like him, father. He's the one who's been cutting my nets and smashing my traps and filling in my pits. With him out there, I'll never catch another beast. His father blinked his blind old eyes and said, King Gilgamesh has more wisdom than most. Go to Yurik, son, and ask the mighty Gilgamesh what to do. Hunter did not hesitate. He ran and ran, already happier and more hopeful. The name of Yurik was full of magic to him, a place he had never been but a place famous throughout the world for its wonder. Long before the strip of gold on the horizon resolved itself into bricks and buttresses, Hunter knew it was the shining wall of Uruk, curving out of the plain like a wave breaking. Before he could clearly see patterns on the strip of gold, he knew they were the carved memorials of great men. Where can I find Gilgamesh the king? he panted, resting his hands on his knees. The men at the gate scowled at him. The women by the well turned aside their eyes. He might as well have named the monster Huwawa. So Hunter headed for the largest palace, the tallest tower, and asked there for Gilgamesh. Why? asked the men at the door. Go away from here, huntsman. You are better off in the wilderness. Why? asked Hunter, gazing around him in wonder at the glazed tiles, the ivory carvings, the great glossy teak bowls of flower petals, the host of servants silent as shadows. What more wonderful place on earth is there than Uruk? None, replied the usher who led him to the king's audience chamber. If it weren't for its king, I do not know what troubles bring you to Uruk, young man. None so great as ours, I'll be bound. For what greater burden can a city bear than Gilgamesh? And the word fell from his mouth with a wriggle and hiss of a servant. Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh? Hunter was astounded. But he's famous! Never loses a battle. Beautiful like a god. Everyone says. Hmm, said the usher. And the look on his face admitted that all those things were true. What then? Is he a, a despot? A tyrant? The usher breathed a sigh of unspeakable wariness. He has worn us down like a river flowing through the gorge, like a waterfall splashing onto rocks. So much life, so much energy. He makes perpetual war, you know. He spends our sons like so many arrows in his quiver. And for what? For the excitement of battle charge. He is forever building new towers. For what? For the sake of touching the sky. You see the wall that surrounds Zurich? Who do you think toiled under the sun to drag the stones? We call on the gods to spare us. But on and on runs Gilgamesh with us for the soles of his sandals. The usher showed Hunter into the great hall of Gilgamesh the Mighty, and there Hunter saw him, an exceptionally tall young man standing on the sill of the great window, watching the building work in progress outside. He paced incessantly up and down, tossing out orders like lava bombs from a volcano. That stone is orange, not gold. That door does not hang true. Curse, Huawa! If it weren't for him, I would build in cedar wood. Fetch up another team of oxen. He was outrageously handsome, with huge dark eyes and springy short black hair. The tissue of his linen skirt was so fine that his legs showed through quite plainly, a runner's legs. His skin gleamed with almond oil, and he smelt of the bathhouse and of nutmeg. His belt was gold wire, his collar of lapis lazuli, and when he turned his great eyes on Hunter, it was as if Enlil the Creator had paused in shaping the world to watch a hovering bee. It also seemed to Hunter that the king had been expecting someone else. 
A pang of disappointment crossed the handsome face at seeing a mere trapper. "'O oh, mighty king, your wisdom is talked of all over,' said Hunter awkwardly. Then he blurted out his story of the wild man. The king listened with only half an ear, still watching the building work from the window. His feet were never still. He looked like a man treading water. When Hunter fell silent, Gilgamesh turned and smiled the most fleeting of smiles. "'Go and find the prettiest dancing girl in Uruk, and take her with you to the drinking place. Use her beauty to lure the wild man out of the wilderness. Have her tame him. That is my advice.' And having given him his advice, Gilgamesh's interest was gone. He was bored again and restless, but he called out as Hunter backed through the heavy door hanging, "'Tell me, did you meet anyone on the road? Someone on his way here? Someone like me?' "'There is no one like Gilgamesh,' said Hunter, and clambered backwards through the curtain as fast as it would let him. Chapter 2 Tamed by a kiss. Enkidu was formed out of clay. Aruru, goddess of beginnings, dipped dawn fingers into the sea and pinched off a knob of earth, smoothing it into the shape of a man. And that was Enkidu. But the clay she used was full of tree bark, leaf mold, broken snail shells, and seed husks, so that the man she made was shaggy and rough, with a pelt of matted hair and a bark brown face. When he opened his nut-brown eyes, he found himself among animals. The wild ass would stand still while he drank her milk. The birds sing an answer to his whistle. The wild dogs fawn sooner than bite him, but Enkidu did not know if he was an ass, a dog, or bird. Whenever he found traps or nets or pits left by hunters, Enkidu spoiled them, because he thought of the animals as his family. But the day he saw a hunter crouching by the waterhole, he felt more puzzlement than hostility. Here was a beast like him, a small, scrawny version of the reflection Enkidu saw when he lay down to drink from the pool. Still, Enkidu's brain was made from clay, and after the trapper ran away, his smell faded from the waterhole, and Enkidu forgot him. Then, suddenly one day, there came an altogether different smell. As sweet as wild honey, it made the long hair stir on Enkidu's skin. He walked fast then faster, breaking into a loping run. The smell was like hunger and thirst, hot and cold all rolled together into a craving. The woman was sitting cross-legged on a blanket, her eyes trailing butterflies through the sunlit trees. At the sight of Enkidu, she raised one arm, waved one hand. She was totally, goldenly, shell-smoothly naked. For hour after hour, there she sat, fanning herself with a large leaf, or plaiting her long black hair. Closer and closer he sidled, bristling with uneasiness, brim full of strange new appetites. The woman reached out a hand, curling a single finger, beckoning. At last, Enkidu put down his head and charged. Arms and legs outstretched, he hurled himself like a boulder onto an egg, but she did not break. And she would not fight. Instead, she curled her arms around his neck and pressed her mouth against his. Hello, she said. His arms and legs turned to water. His strength ebbed away like water on sand. All his instincts had been right. Here was a snare, an ambush, a trap, a pit into which he had fallen. And yet Enkidu did not care. It was a sweet trap, a soft pit, a silken snare. I am Hattie. The trapper brought me all the way from Uruk. Have you ever seen Uruk, wild man? It is one of the seven cities of the plain. Once upon a time, seven wise men founded seven cities and taught the people how to pray, how to worship, how to make verses and paint and sing and write. Uruk is called the City of Great Streets. In the mornings, a drum summons the men to work. You should see the robes the great men wear. In Uruk the vines grow like hair over the roofs of the houses, and the flower sellers move about bright as hummingbirds. The women play with their little children under the shady trees, and there is always a sound of water from the wells. The river winds by, and washed clothes blow about in the trees on the riverside. As she talked, she plucked the burrs from his woolly skin, 
and tease the matted knots out of his waist-length hair. Every time he shaped his mouth into a howl or a snarl, she pressed her lips to his. Come with me to the camp of the shepherds and meet more men like yourself. Eat roast meat, white bread. Life is good among friends. The warmth of the campfire at night, the smell of baking in the mornings. Her voice was musical, and her words fell like rain on his brain of clay. She gave him wine, too, pouring it into his mouth along with kisses. After seven days, the wind brought him the scent of the hills. Throwing her aside, he leapt to his feet and ran, back into the hills, his clay brain slippery with wine, his head a rattle with words. He ran to find the wild ass for a drink of her milk, but the asses scattered. The gazelle sprang away from him in huge arcing bounds. The wild dog growled, and the birds rose into the sky like ash from fire. He was no longer one of their kind. He had on him the smell of perfume and sweet oil and wine. Confused, alone, he roamed about, shouting some of the strange words he had heard on the woman's lips. Jugglers! Temple Top! Lukulbanda! Berry Juice! Gilgamesh! And his roaring took him back to the drinking place. Still Hattie sat on her blanket, legs crossed, hands on her ankles. She beckoned to him, and this time he understood when she said, Come, Enkidu, and let me show you the world of men. Hunter was delighted at what Hattie had achieved. He could see at once that Enkidu was no longer a beast to fear. There would be no more broken traps or torn nets. Hunter and the shepherds laughed to see how the ignorant brute called Enkidu could not even drink from a cup, did not know what to do with a loaf of bread or a dish of lentils. But Hattie did not laugh. She sat beside Enkidu, her torrent of black hair breaking over his bent knee, showing him how to use a knife, how to refill a cup. The shepherds stopped laughing when they saw him cram down seven loaves and drain the last of their wine. "'Your food is good,' said Enkidu, finishing another loaf of bread. "'What must I do to sit at your fireside another day?' Hunter gasped. Hattie had taught the wild man to speak. "'These shepherds take turns at night to keep watch, guarding the sheep from lions and wolves.' "'No longer,' declared Enkidu. "'I shall keep watch all night, and by day I shall kill lions. I sleep little.' The shepherds looked at one another in delight. The protector of animals had become the protector of flocks. Enkidu, having lost one family in the uplands, had found another on the plains. He was happy in a restless, waiting way. One evening at the fireside, Hattie said, I should go back to Uruk. I'm a dancing girl. My place is in the city of streets. Poor you, said the shepherds, with genuine sympathy. Ah, now, Gilgamesh may be a trial to his people, argued Hunter, but it was his genius that tamed Enkidu. Who is this Gilgamesh? said Enkidu, bridling a little. A tyrant and a marvel, so they say. A blessing and a curse, I heard. A dream and a nightmare. So Enkidu learned of King Gilgamesh of Uruk, who had worn down his people like water falling on a rock, who had spent them in wars like so many arrows, who exhausted them with his boundless energy. The wild man flared into a rage at what they told him. Is that any way for a father of his people to behave? I shall go to Uruk and challenge this Gilgamesh. He leapt to his feet. This demon must not be allowed to trample the hearts of his own people. Soft-palmed, sponge-bellied city sluggard, I shall pound him into clay. King Gilgamesh was contemplating marriage. Every day he shut himself up in the temple of Ishtar, goddess of love, and the people outside could hear the slap of his sandals on the pavement. The city swarmed with panic. Rumor had it that the king would marry the terrible Ishtar herself. Then a new stir swirled through the marketplace. The crowds parted for a new face, a man almost as alarming as Gilgamesh in his size and the spread of his shoulders. Hattie, the pretty little dancing girl, was with him. The crowd murmured and gasped. He is the size of Gilgamesh. Shorter. Yes, but thicker set. A wild man bred up with lions. 
Gilgamesh came out of the temple and turned towards his mother's house. His mind was made up. He would woo and marry the goddess of love. She was the only fitting bride. Enkidu stepped out into his path. Gilgamesh, deep in thoughts of marriage, moved to go round him. Enkidu stuck out a foot and tripped him up. Gilgamesh grabbed Enkidu's arm as he fell and pulled him down too. He was instantly enraged. They wrestled in the doorways of the houses, their bulk smashing the doorposts and bringing down the lintels. They grappled each other head to head, chest to chest, barging through the walls of buildings. First Gilgamesh was on his back, his face full of the wild man's hair, his nose bleeding. Then the king was on top of Enkidu, their hands locked together. Scattering chickens, demolishing goat pens, overturning pails, the two men wrestled for fully an hour. Then Gilgamesh caught Enkidu off balance, and with a twist of the body, hurled him to the ground. Enkidu lay winded. Gilgamesh, hands clasped on knees, snorted out a triumphant laugh as he struggled to catch his breath. Then Enkidu too laughed. Lying on his back, he saw the fearful stars blinking down between the high buildings and laughed out loud. There's not another man in the world like you, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh sat down with his back against a wall. It was an unfamiliar feeling to be tired out. The two men looked at one another. Then Enkidu flexed his arms and Gilgamesh flexed his, and they fell on each other again. But this time it was an embrace. They hugged each other with the passion of new friends who know that they will stick together through thick and thin, come what may, do or die. Chapter 3 do or die. Like the axe in his dream, Gilgamesh wore Enkidu at his side and swore never to be parted from him. I must have been mad to contemplate marriage, he told Enkidu, especially to Ishtar. Gilgamesh schooled Enkidu in the ways of civilization, and then Enkidu taught him the ways of the wild places, how the honey ant gathers its winter food, how mistletoe grows without a root, how water can be mined out of the driest desert. They wrestled, and raced, and hunted, and talked, and the people of Uruk breathed a sigh of relief and gave thanks to the gods. Enkidu had roamed far afield, into the wildest places. He had seen things which Gilgamesh had never seen. He had swum in both the Tigris and the Euphrates, had stood on the summit of Mount Nasir, where the Ark ran aground after the Great Flood, he had seen the monstrous Huwawa, protector of the cedar forests, and the scorpion men who guard the roadway to the Garden of the Gods. One day, as Gilgamesh showed Enkidu the sights of the city, he pointed out the carved stone friezes recording the deeds of Yurik's great men. "'Where are the deeds of Gilgamesh?' asked Enkidu. "'Here!' cried Gilgamesh, spread eagling himself against the wall. "'This blank!' So far I've done nothing worth carving in that stone. But soon, soon, Enkidu, you and I are going on such an adventure that no wall will be large enough to record it. We are. Enkidu too flattened himself against the wall, striking a grand pose. Where? When? Now? The very ends of his long hair crackled with energy. It was you who gave me the idea. Who's the most frightening foe in all the world? Enkidu racked his brains. Gilgamesh is. Ask his enemies. Gilgamesh laughed. Someone far more dangerous. We are going to fight Huwawa, guardian of the cedar forests, and kill him, and bring home cedarwood to build new gates for Uruk. Enkidu stepped away from the wall. Ah, now listen. You're forgetting. I've seen Huwawa. He's a monster among monsters. The trees are small alongside him. His strength is the stuff of legends. He never sleeps. When a fox stamps its paw sixty leagues away, Huwawa hears it. He lives for battle. He was made for no other purpose than to guard the forest. No one goes there for fear of him. Besides, a kind of magic surrounds him. You can't go close without your strength ebbing away. If you had seen Huwawa... I would have killed him already, declared Gilgamesh. We have to make our mark, don't we? What are you afraid of? Of getting killed, 
said Enkidu candidly. Gilgamesh spread his arms high above his head, as if reaching up to clutch the hems of the gods. Then we'll have died gloriously, won't we? And our names will be written in clouds of glory on the noonday sky. Fame is everything, Enkidu, isn't it? Why live if not to make a mark on the world, to blaze a trail through it, to do deeds worthy of remembrance? Do or die! Both his fists were clenched, his feet set square onto life, like a prize fighter. A surge of love and pride thrilled through Enkidu. Do or die, he cried, and closed his own hand around the king's upraised fist. Just do me one favor. The cedar forest belongs to Shamash the sun. Don't fly in the face of the gods. Tell Shamash what you want to do. Ask his blessing. That is how Gilgamesh came to be standing at high noon in the full glare of the sun, a white kid at his feet and in his right hand a silver scepter which caught the sunbeams as he spoke. O sun, O lord and master who sees all, only help me do this thing, and I shall build you a temple all of cedar wood, wood from your own forests. O sun, you who are robed in fiery splendor, surely you understand a man's need to cloak himself in glory. Swaying as he prayed, Gilgamesh felt the tears on his cheeks dry to streaks of white salt. Then it was as if a red-hot hand rested on the crown of his head. Shamash had given his blessing. Crowds of curious onlookers had gathered, round-eyed, fearful, wondering. "'People of Uruk!' cried Gilgamesh. "'I go to the forests of cedar trees to cut cedar for new city gates and a temple to the god Shamash.' There I shall do battle with Huawa, the evil one. Pray for me and make offerings to the sun. I shall bring back such glory to Yurik that the name of Yurik will live forever in the annals of the world. The crowd gave a nervous laugh and burst out singing. A clumsy shuffling dance carried them home to their houses. Gilgamesh and Enkidu went to the forges and gave orders for two axes and two swords. Armorers and craftsmen went out into the ancient groves and cut willows and boxwood for axe handles and spear shafts. But they sent to Anshan in Persia for wood fine enough to make the king's bow. The axe of Gilgamesh was called Might of Heroes, his bow Anshan. Each stage of the craftsmanship was watched over by Gilgamesh and Enkidu, where they knew that their lives would depend on these weapons. As the golden sparks flew up from the anvil, the elderly counselors of Uruk gathered in the doorway of the forge. Their old heads were white with the snow of wisdom. You are young, Gilgamesh. Youth is rash. We beg you to reconsider. This Huawa is a thing of spirit and magic, invincible. But Gilgamesh only laughed. What do you want me to do, gentlemen? Sit at home for three score years? Wrap up warm in winter and keep cool in the summer and stay safe here in Uruk? The blacksmith passed a finished sword into his outstretched hands. It weighed as much as a grown man, but he handled it as delicately as a newborn baby. The counselors shook their wise old heads. There is no telling young people anything they do not want to hear. They comforted themselves on the way home, saying, if anyone can do this thing, it is Gilgamesh and his friend, the Wild Man. Ninsun, the king's mother, sent for Enkidu. Remember to dig a well every evening, Enkidu, and offer up pure water to the sun god every day. Oh, look after him, Enkidu. You are not my son. I did not give birth to you. But bring Gilgamesh safe home, and I shall adopt you as my own. I am relying on you, Enkidu. The wild man bowed his head. For the first time, he realized that there was someone else in the world who loved Gilgamesh as much as he did. What a way it was to the land of the cedar forests. Even though the friends walked fifty leagues a day, and accomplished in three days what it would take others six weeks to do, they still had seven mountains to cross before they stood at the forest gate. Carved in a dozen languages were warnings and prohibitions. Do not enter. Cut no trees on pain of death. This forest is protected by Huawa, terror of the earth. And yet the woodlands beyond the gate were as greenly peaceful as the bottom of a lake. 
Birdsong rippled outward from it, tinkling in wavelets. Enkidu shoved open the gate. His knees sagged, his head spun, his hands prickled as though stabbed by a thousand splinters. He jumped awkwardly backwards. Gilgamesh, don't go in there! The magic is too strong! The moment I touched the gate, my strength failed me! But Gilgamesh was already whistling his way along the broad green pathways of the wood. In the center of the forest stood a green mountain, a perfect cone rising up so high that its peak was hidden by cloud. Its peaceful slope seemed a perfect place to sleep. Without even troubling to dig a well and refill their water skins, the friends stretched out on the ground. Still, they slept hand in hand, so as to wake one another at the first sign of danger. At midnight, Enkidu woke to the feeling of his knuckles being crushed together. Gilgamesh was sitting bolt upright, his eyes glistening in the dark. I had a dream, he said. I dreamt the top of the mountain melted, and the earth spewed out its blood, fire and molten rock, and so much smoke and ash that the sun turned black. What does it mean? Enkidu laughed and extricated his hand. It means we've come to the land of volcanoes, friend, he said. In this part of the world, the mountains erupt like spots on a young man's cheek. What else did you dream? I dreamt that the earth trembled under me, and the clouds of dust flew up so that I couldn't breathe, couldn't see, and everything around me caught fire like kindling. What kind of portent is that for the gods to send me? What does it mean? Again, Enkidu laughed. It means we are in the land of earthquakes. Do you know nothing? The world's skin is like the skin of a lizard. Now and then the scales twitch, and the earth shakes. What else did you dream? I dreamt a bull said Gilgamesh, his teeth chattering at the memory of it. Not just a bull, I mean, a giant of a bull, bigger than twenty bulls. It was head down and charging right at you, and there was nothing I could do. Nothing. Nothing. Enkidu scratched his head. Huawa is nothing like a bull, he said, puzzled. His face is like a lion, and he has fangs like a dragon. I don't know why you should dream a... Gilgamesh? But Gilgamesh had fallen asleep, his head on Enkidu's shoulder. When daylight came, he was still sound asleep. Enkidu touched him. Enkidu shook him. Enkidu took hold of him by the ears and banged his head on the ground, but he would not wake up. He was under the influence of Huwawa's magic. The whole day came and went, and still Gilgamesh slept. Enkidu was panic-stricken. "'Wake up!' he bellowed in his friend's ear. Wake up! Must I tell your mother that I let you die in your sleep? Do you want Huwawa to find you like this? He slapped Gilgamesh. He rolled him down the hill. He held their empty water skins over his friend. Oh, why had he not heeded Ninsun's advice? Enkidu dug and dug, but found no water. He ran and ran until pebbles flew from under his feet as sparks had from the blacksmith's hammer. At last he heard the soft tinkle of trinkling water. Splashing into the stream, he scooped the water skin through the cool, delicious water. Then back he ran, and upending the bag, emptied it in the king's face. At last the dark brown eyes opened. Stretching himself, Gilgamesh picked up his breastplate and put it on. He was perfectly calm. Let us go and meet our enemy. Enkidu kicked aside his bow in disgust. You go if you like, but I'm going back to the city. You have no idea. You don't know what you're up against. Me, I'll go back and tell your mother how brave you are, how heroic, how glorious, how dead. Gilgamesh calmly strung his bow. Don't launch the funeral barge yet. What can go wrong with the two of us side by side? Do you really want me to tell you? said Enkidu. Inside his cedarwood house, the giant Huwawa cocked his giant head on one side and listened. A smile came to his lips, which curled like the bark from a silver birch. He reached out and took down his first cloak of splendor. Six more hung alongside it, woven out of magic and the fibers of the forest. He opened his door, stuck out his head, and bellowed, Who has come into the forest? Let him die! All the acorns fell from the trees. 
all the nests of the previous spring. He looked, and as he looked, the beam of his looking scythed down the trees. He nodded his head, and malign magic rolled to the forest, bluer and deeper than drifts of bluebells. Then he stepped out of doors. The green forest was like grass around his feet. He blotted out the sun. Gilgamesh, caught in the coal-black shadow, looked up. Oh, Enkidu, he said. He had never thought anything could be so big. Then Shamash the sun looked down and saw Gilgamesh and his friend like two tiny ants in the path of an elephant's stampede. The sun breathed in, fetching the warm winds. He reached out to the sea and grasped the north wind and the water spouts, lightning and phosphorescent fire. He turned about and about, and the elements were twisted into a single whiplash, its thongs sharp with hail and sleet. But the guardian only ran back into his house and grabbed his second cloak. He had been formed to protect the forests, and even the master of those forests could not call him to heal. Gilgamesh was wielding his axe now, hacking at the outermost walls of the lodge to bring it down. Seven walls, one inside another, and inside the seventh, the guardian, bellowing flame and destruction. Huawa put on the third of his seven cloaks. But with every passing moment, more of the winds of heaven piled up around the Cedarwood Lodge. They turned back Huawa's powers like a mirror turns back light. The guardian put on the fourth of his seven cloaks, and the walls of his lodge bowed outward, so great was the magic within. Huawa put on the fifth and sixth of his seven cloaks, and for twenty thousand leagues the cedar forest trembled. At last the seventh cedar wall fell, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu, axes in hand, came face to face with Huawa. Seven cloaks billowed around him like the rays of a rainbow. Magic shone from his open mouth, from the heels of his hands, from the fabric of his skin. Huawa might be terrible, but he was also magnificent. Suddenly a cyclone of twisted wind and heat bound him around. He was powerless to strike the heroes dead. Let me go, Gilgamesh, he said. Spare me and I shall be your slave, and cut down the trees myself to build you a fitting palace. Gilgamesh hesitated. He glanced sideways at Enkidu. Don't listen to him urged Enkidu. It's a trick! Kill him! Gilgamesh swung back his axe over one shoulder. But Enkidu, if we kill him, all that glory will be lost to the world forever! Don't let him fool you, Gilgamesh! He was not at all sure how long those ropes of wind binding Huawa's arms would hold him, how long before the giant would squirm free. It took three blows to dispatch the guardian of the forests. He sprawled on his face, the trees falling flat for acres around. The phosphorescent glory which had hung about Huawa went out like a blown candle. He was a mound of vegetable matter, a hummock in the landscape. Dead. Gilgamesh, walking the length of the guardian's dead body, felt the spark of life flare up inside his own. He had survived. He was alive, even more alive than before. All the colors of the forest were more bright, the bird song sweeter, the smell is more delectable. The touch of his friend's hand on his arm made him dizzy with joy. They found the tallest cedar tree in the entire forest and hacked it down. It fell with a deafening hiss of the leaves. From this the carpenters of Uruk would fashion a mighty gate to the city. Then in reverence to the sun, Gilgamesh washed himself in the river, put on clean robes, and made an offering of cold water to Shamash. Holding up the silver bowl, while the noonday heat drank it up in steamy white sips. And looking down, Ishtar, goddess of love, saw the finest sight the world had to offer. A young man covered in glory, triumphant, silhouetted against the sinking sun, a silver bowl upraised, face shining with pent-up happiness, King Gilgamesh. Chapter 4 Marry Me Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, how well you look in my temple of love. Gilgamesh spun around. Through the perfumed smoke of the temple came a woman astounding in every way, swaying her hips, lifting her hair from the nape of her neck with both wrists. That hair. 
It spilled down like wine over brimming a beaker, from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. It was Ishtar, goddess of love. Enkidu's heart sank, for he could see that Ishtar was in love. She would twine her slender brown arms around Gilgamesh, and Enkidu's newfound friend would be lost to him, for who could resist the goddess of love? He crept away into the daylight. Gilgamesh, said Ishtar, killing Huawa was a feat worthy of a god. My heart was in my mouth as you fought. Now it is in my hands. Think, Gilgamesh, if I were to give that heart to you, think, I would make you a chariot of lapis with golden wheels. Kings and princes would lie like carpet under your feet. I could give you storm demons to pull your wagons. Nothing less will do for a husband of mine. She brought her face close up against his. Her breath smelt of nutmeg and roses. I love you, King of Uruk. Marry me. Gilgamesh breathed her in. The perfume made him dizzy. Then resting his hand on her upper arms, he said, I'll pay you all the prayers and sacrifices a devout man ought to pay a goddess. I always have and I always will. But as for marrying you, ho oh, oh. He sucked the air in through his teeth. Not for all the honey in the hive, lady. And he stood her away from him as if he were sliding a chair back under a table. Ishtar's jaw dropped. A tendril of hair found its way into her mouth, and she spat it out again, blinking, astounded. I'm flattered you should woo me, Gilgamesh went on. But frankly, I'd rather play dice with a handful of scorpions. I've heard about the men that you've loved in the past, and I've heard what became of them once you lost interest. Being loved by you is rather like being struck by masonry falling off a high building, isn't it? Walking round and round her, he counted off on his fingers all the young men who had ever caught the eye of Ishtar. Remind me, what became of your husband, Tammuz? Such a devoted lover. When your sister was holding you prisoner in the underworld, who took your place? Tammuz, the only person fool enough to spend an eternity in the dark so that his true love could live in the sunlight. Take that shepherd, remember? The one who brought you mealy cakes and roasted his fluffy little kids for your supper. Played flute tunes to you on a bone whistle. He thought he was the happiest man alive. Till you tired of him and turned him into a wolf. Where is he these days? Still carrying his tail between his legs? Still howling at the moon? And didn't you love the king of the lions once? The one who died in those traps you dug for him? And that horse that you took your fancy to? Spurs and a whip, that was his reward in the end. You rode him seven leagues with spurs and a whip, and then let him slake his thirst in muddy water. Take that bird who sang for you, the one with the multicolored plumes. When you tired of him, you smashed him like a ball with a racket, and now he sits on a branch and weeps, My wing, my wing, my poor broken wing. Ishtar opened and shut her mouth, but no words came out. Oh, and that gardener, who tended your father's date palms? Does he enjoy being a mole, would you think? The trouble with you, madam, is that you start by kissing and end by cursing. I know you, lady, and I'd sooner wear tight shoes for the rest of my life than be married to you. And with a laugh which set all the candle flames quivering, Gilgamesh dodged her clawing fingernails, skipped out into the clean white sunlight, and ran to find Enkidu. Ishtar gave a gasping roar. Oh! She beat her fists against the wall. Oh! She stamped and flung herself about in an ecstasy of rage. Oh! She ran all the way to heaven and threw herself down at her father's feet, weeping bitterly. It's Gilgamesh, she sobbed. Destroy him! Let me destroy him! He has insulted me! Anu fingered his beard. How? What did he say? He listed all my lovers and what I had done to them. Anu said, And? Did he slander you? Was it untrue? He called me a... a... Anu leaned forwards expectantly. Yes, what did he call you? Falling masonry, a pair of tight shoes. Why are you laughing? Never mind what he called me, the wretch, the vile 
beastly, wicked, blaspheming nobody. He must be destroyed. Give me the bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh and his famous city of streets. He slaughtered Huwawa, and now he has slighted me. Anu's amusement turned to dismay at the news of Huwawa's death. Here was a serious affront to mighty Enlil, who had created the guardian of the cedar forests. Gilgamesh should not have pitted himself against the gods in such a way. Then loose the bull of heaven and destroy him, cried Ishtar. Do you know what you are asking, Ishtar? If I loose the bull of heaven, it will be seven years before Yurik recovers. Famine and drought, destruction. Have you thought of the innocent people who may die? Ishtar wagged a dismissive hand. Yes, yes. The granaries are full, the people won't suffer, but Gilgamesh must. I demand that Gilgamesh pay for what he said. Well? Her tears splashed like hot lead on the pavement of heaven. Anu looked at his daughter. Anger made her ugly, as it makes all faces ugly. Her man's beard came bristling through the skin of her jaw. Her teeth were bared, her eyes bloodshot with shouting. It was plain there would be no peace until Ishtar got her way. Not the bull of heaven, daughter. Choose some lesser punishment. If you don't give me what I want, hissed Ishtar, her voice so menacing that even Anu shivered, I shall go now and smash the bolts on the gates of the underworld. I shall loose all the souls of the dead. Ishtar! Up they will come, shrieking and gibbering out of the ground, jostling shoulders with the living. No one will quite know whether the man beside him is a ghost, or if the bride behind the veil has been dead since the flood. Wait until the dead become hungry and begin to eat! Anu shuddered in disgust. Stop, Ishtar! The dead loosed from the underworld to eat the living. Ishtar, enough! Well? I shall loose the bull of heaven, daughter. But it grieves me that a man should be punished simply for speaking the truth. In the city of Uruk, red dust trickled from the sandstone buildings, and all the dogs began to bark. Cockerels crowed in the middle of the night, and dates fell from the palm trees in fat black splats. The city of streets was feeling the approach of the Bull of Heaven. Then everyone in Uruk was awake and running, yelling and pointing out over the plain. The goddess Ishtar was coming out of the dawn, leading the Bull of Heaven, and no one had seen such a sight in the history of the world. From the parapets of the city wall, Gilgamesh and Enkidu watched. The bull was as big as a herd of elephants within the one hide. Its great dew-lapped throat swept the ground, and its horns spread like twin water spouts catching the light. Plated in lapis lazuli, their shining blue bow was as huge as the prow and stern of a ship. Ishtar led it to the far bank of the river. How women do hate to be spurned, said Enkidu softly. He could smell the sweat in his friend's palms, smell his own fear come to that. Here was destruction made flesh. Then it stamped, and there was no more thinking. The bull stamped, and the earth simply opened up. Acres of ground subsided into a bottomless crevasse, and with it a hundred young men. Again the bull pawed in at the ground, head down, the ugly hump of its back quaking. Within the city, the granaries fractured like stone eggs, spilling grain. Carved friezes crazed and fell in shards. Towers swayed and crumbled into dust, and a twinned, forked, jagged chasm yawned in the ground, swallowing up two hundred warriors of Uruk. The river Euphrates cascaded down into the darkness. A single scream of terror hung in the air. It had the color of red dust and settled on Gilgamesh like blood. At the third stamp, the very walls of Uruk wavered like sheets of water. Enkidu was jarred off his feet and struck his head against the parapet. Pain paralyzed him. It seemed to sing through his skull and unstring his spine. Then he was on his feet again. Quick, before it can charge the city gate! Launching himself off the high wall, Enkidu landed between the very horns of the bull, grasping them like the shafts of a cart. The foam from its nostrils burst into his face, blinding him. Gilgamesh leapt down as well, sore drawn. Well, friend, 
Didn't we say we would make a name for ourselves? Called Enkidu. Strike behind the horns if you can. Bucking stiff-legged, turning and turning on the spot, the bull of heaven lashed Enkidu with its thick, hairy cable of a tail and sent him sprawling along its back. But Gilgamesh was there to vault over the nose and take hold of the horns in Enkidu's place, to wrench them round until the beast was brought to a standstill. Enkidu, meanwhile, slithered over the bull's rump, grabbing the tail as he went, pulling it like a bell rope, hanging on even when the dust from under its iron hooves enveloped him in gritty darkness. Digging in with his heels, he hauled on the tail, quick, wrenching tugs which took its attention away from the flimsy gate, away from Gilgamesh straddling its neck. There was a flash of light, a hiss and a thud, and the blade of Gilgamesh's sword drove home right up to its hilt in the arch of the bull's neck, just between the nape and the horns. For long seconds the bull held still, the foam dripping from its nostrils into a sudsy pool between its feet. Then it staggered sideways, crashed against the walls of Uruk, lurched the other way. It stumbled as far as the river before falling into what little water was left, turning it blood red. Enkidu sat on the ground, holding his head, and Hattie the dancing girl ran towards him, asking was he hurt, could she help? Up on the wall, a wall crazed now with jagged cracks, Ishtar, the goddess of love, let out a howl of pure hatred. Tears burst through her tightly shut lids, making runnels in the red dust which had painted her the color of rage. See how they have butchered the lovely bull of heaven! Weep, women, at what they have done! And the women did begin weeping, not for the carcass lying in the river's mud, perhaps, but for the three hundred young men swallowed up by the earth, for the empty river, for the spoiled beauty of the city. Enkidu was disgusted. He twisted off the bull's back leg and shied it at Ishtar, as he might at a cat yowling on a wall. If I could get my hands on you, I'd show you butchery. Gilgamesh stood on the body of the great bull. See the horns plated in lapis? I shall fill them with oil and offer the oil to my guardian gods. Then I shall hang them on the wall of my palace to remind me how I slew the bull of heaven. And the men, happy to be alive, cheered and carried Gilgamesh and Enkidu shoulder high into the battered city. Through streets strewn with rubble, past broken pillars and burning buildings, they carried Gilgamesh. He felt his everlasting fame assured. Who fought the bull of heaven? he shouted. And the clamoring little boys shouted back, Gilgamesh! Gilgamesh! Who killed the bull of heaven? He called out to a group of dancing girls, watching the mob tumble by. The girls eyed one another uncertainly, lids still red with weeping. Then Hattie, the friend of Enkidu, stepped out of the shade into the sunlight. Gilgamesh and Enkidu! she called in her high, singing voice. After that, the girls, too, were running alongside, whooping and chanting, Gilgamesh! Enkidu! Gilgamesh! Enkidu! Only the mothers and the old women stood in their doorways, shawls drawn tight under their chins, silent. And high on her tower, Ishtar, alone and disregarded, chewed on her plate of hair and cursed Gilgamesh under her breath. Death to Gilgamesh and Enkidu! A curse on their friendship and on their happiness! Justice on their mortal heads! Enkidu's head ached where it had slammed against the wall. Throughout the celebrations, he felt a little sick. That night he slept a sleep of utter exhaustion, and to the beating of the drums in his head, he dreamed a dream. The gods were gathered in conference. Anu, the father of the gods, was there. So too was Enlil, god of heroes. Ea, the maker of mankind. Nergal of the underworld. Ninurta, god of war. A small patch of brightness which pained Enkidu too much to look at, he took to be Shamash the sun. The gods stood shoulder to shoulder in a ring, their heads close together. My daughter is right, Anu was saying. Someone must pay. And yet they fought well. No warrior ever fought better, said Ninurta. I would take two, but I will settle for one, said Nergal. Shut out by the circle of backs, 
Enkidu found it hard to hear. Apparently some crime had been committed. Shamash was speaking now. It was Gilgamesh who killed Hawawa. But it was Enkidu who cut down the tallest tree. As in all the worst dreams, Enkidu tried to speak, tried to put his side of the argument, but his hands would not lift and there was no breath in his lungs. His shouts only emerged in whimpers. Shamash was saying, Were they not, in a way, honoring us by these heroic deeds? Enlil rounded on Shamash. The Bull of Heaven has been killed! Law demands the death penalty. It is simply a matter of deciding who shall die. Gilgamesh or Enkidu. Gilgamesh or Enkidu. Gilgamesh or Enkidu. Gilgamesh or... He woke with the name of his friend on his lips. Gilgamesh or... He was wet with sweat and shivering. He had to go and tell Gilgamesh, to warn him. Dreams were not just the rotting vegetation of the past, the leaves blown down from the day before. Dreams were omens. Dreams were messages. He slipped his legs off the bed and tried to stand up. But the roaring inside his head was like the bull of heaven bellowing. He covered his eyes, but the light still seared through to his brain. Sweat crawled down his body like a swarm of beetles, and his guts ached. Gilgamesh, he tried to call, but his own name emerged instead. Enkidu, Enkidu must die. Chapter 5 Death Gilgamesh sponged his friend's face and put a cup of water to his lips. Soon be well, Kidu, soon be well. Enkidu turned his face away. The pain inside his head was like an axe blow. The gods say not. The gods say I must die. But Gilgamesh snorted dismissively. Everyone dreams bad dreams when they're sick. Come on, man. Heroes like us aren't afraid of anything, are we? Two days later, Enkidu was powerless to sit up, unable to eat. A pulse of fear started up within Gilgamesh despite himself. Soon be well, friend, he kept saying but Enkidu only groaned. Something worse than misgiving seized on Gilgamesh. I'll go to the temple, Kidu. I'll go and pray for you. The gods will listen to me. Shamash listened before. I'll have the goldsmiths make a statue of you. Yes, I will. I'll tell them to make a golden statue of you and offer it up to the gods in place of the real thing. Why don't I do that? Yes! Wait here. Don't worry. You mustn't worry. Everything will be all right and he was gone, running towards the temple, shouting commands, summoning his craftsmen. Enkidu was left alone on his bed. The sun moved round, and a ray of sunlight like a fist punched through the window and struck him in the face. O oh, Shamash, you faceless orange clod, hear my curses, he told the sun. Let my curse fall on that trapper who fetched me out of the wild. Make him smell so bad that the beasts sent him twelve leagues off. Let him never catch another creature, not so much as a gerbil. Let him fall into his own pits. Let the lions tear him limb from limb. And Hattie, oh, curse the dancing girl for me. Let all doors shut against her. Give her nowhere to sleep but the rubbish heap. I was so happy before she came. Out there in the wilderness, I was happy. But she had to come along and daub me with kisses. She made the animals shun me, so let her be shunned. He broke off, panting for breath. His skull seemed to be squeezing the blood from his brain. The window hanging blew out in a draft and set the sunlight dancing. The beams were full of motes like stylus marks on a tablet of yellow clay, dancing too excitedly to be read. It seemed to Enkidu that a voice came rustling in at the window along that breeze a voice so soft and gentle that he had to strain to hear it. Enkidu, oh Enkidu, why curse? Why curse the trapper? And why curse little Hattie? Without them you would never have gone questing after Huwawa, never have fought the Bull of Heaven, never have written your name on history. The city would not now be holding its breath praying for Enkidu. Gilgamesh would not be kneeling now in the temple of the gods, weeping salt tears. Don't you see? Without Hunter and Hattie, you would never have met Gilgamesh. Now Gilgamesh will be the wild man. 
He will mourn you like a wolf baying at the moon and wander the world looking for comfort. Would you really choose to have lived without such a friend? Enkidu's fist closed around the empty air containing the sunbeam. I call them back! Every last curse! Be my witness, Shamash, I call them back! Never have been Gilgamesh! Hunter, may your traps be full every morning! May your arrows never miss their mark! Never have met Gilgamesh! Hattie! Little Hattie! Let men twelve leagues away see you and swoon! Let kings stop their chariots to propose marriage! Let the gods lean out of heaven to whistle at you! Never have met Gilgamesh! That would have been never to have lived at all! We came alive together, he and I! We made sense of it all! We made sense! Enkidu let his hand fall. Fever made the room throb and crinkle like the walls of a bread oven, and his tears were scalding hot, and yet he was easier in his mind. Gilgamesh came bounding back from the temple, hopeful, full of optimism. Now Enkidu would get better. It took only one glance to know he was mistaken. His friend's eyes were shut. Gilgamesh sank his fingers in his friend's hair and shook him. Wake up! I thought you were. Then Gilgamesh cradled his friend in his arms, and their tears soaked indistinguishable into the crumpled pillow. For seven days, Gilgamesh struggled like a man swimming in mid-ocean, trying to keep a friend afloat. Below them, in the depths, cruised death. First it would swallow Enkidu, and then, in the blinking of an eye, Gilgamesh. Life was nothing but treading water until the sharks came along. It's shameful for a man to die like this, said Enkidu. Ishtar hasn't just killed me. She's managed to shame me, too. Listen, why is everywhere so quiet? Gilgamesh eased his arm from under Enkidu and stood up, stiffly. He went to the window with its broad sill and stepped outside, high above the silent city. His voice carried loud over the early morning city. Quiet? It's not quiet, my friend. Can't you hear the people of Yurik weeping for Enkidu? Can't you hear them? The girls who brought you food, the bathhouse girls who rubbed oil into your back, the shepherds all sobbing like children. Listen! And the friends you made, so many friends. And Hattie, little Hattie, he raised his voice still higher. You! You animals in the wilderness! You knew him in his wild days, and you're weeping for him, aren't you? You trees in the cedar forest, you're weeping for him, aren't you? Every place we ever went, every blade of grass we trod underfoot, every river we ever drank from, all the mountains and all the valleys, they're weeping for you. Everyone is mourning, Enkidu. Listen, can't you hear? Why can't you hear? He went back to the man on the bed, still shouting his lament. But Enkidu's eyes remained shut. Gilgamesh laid a hand on the wild man's heart, but knew he would feel no beat. And me, Kidu, and me. I am weeping. I am weeping for you, Enkidu. Wake up now. Wake up now and see how the world prizes you. Don't sleep your life away. Wake up now. Don't get lost in the dark. Gilgamesh covered his friend over with a sheet of silk, carefully, precisely, meticulously, then he let loose the madness which he had kept at bay so long. He smashed everything precious, everything beautiful, ripping down hangings, hurling ornaments out of the window. He tore out his hair and pulled his clothes in shreds, twisting his knuckles white amid their rich fabrics. Then, when the rage was past, he sat down again by his friend, panting, one hand on the silk. Wake up now. Please wake up. The whole household gathered outside the door, whispering anxiously, calling out, offering to carry the body away for burial, but Gilgamesh would not let them in. He fixed his eyes on his friend's shrouded face, and he willed the silk to stir. All that day he sat with the body, all of the next day too. He did not try to hold back his tears. For seven days and seven nights he watched them make their splashy patterns on the tiles at his feet. Then on the eighth day he stopped crying. Realization fell on him like a ton of sand. 
No amount of crying was going to bring Enkidu back. His death went on forever. He got up and opened the door. The smell of decay in the bedroom was choking. Gilgamesh went outside into the sterile sunlight. The little golden statue of Enkidu, which he had commissioned as a bribe to the gods, stood on a table outside the temple of Shamash. Beside it, Gilgamesh set a red carnelian bowl filled with honey and a bowl of lapis lazuli filled with butter, offerings to the gods. After all, they were not really to blame, he mused, as flies droned in circles over the honey and the butter changed from pale gold to a clear, translucent liquor. Mortal men are bound by the rules of nature. For the moment of birth, they are heading towards their death. He would not curse Shamash, or Anu, or Enlil, or Nergal, or even Ishtar for taking his friend away from him. It was unbearable, and yet it had to be born. That was the paradox. Unbearable, and yet it had to be born. Just so long as they did not expect him, too, to die. <laughs>